What's real? I want to know the world as the world really is. Not filtered, not represented, not interpreted. Bedrock reality. Meaning and purpose, if any, depends on it. And it is not simple. For sure, I go to science. I'd also give theology a shot. Immediately, though, I have a problem. How do I know if what I perceive is what is real? My common perceptions can be distorted, say, by optical illusions. Skepticism about everything, science as well as theology, is darkly compelling. Some claim a brighter vision. It's called critical realism. What we think we know, we really know. What we perceive in our brains actually exists in the world. Could critical realism also apprehend God, if there is a God, settle disputes between science and theology? I'll explore critical realism in science and theology. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey. What's critical realism in science? What in theology? I go to the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana, to attend a conference on the quest for consonance theology in the natural sciences. The conference is in honor of Ernan McMullen, a former chairman of Notre Dame's Department of Philosophy and a renowned philosopher of science known for his critical realism. Ernan died in 2011. Four years prior, in 2007, I had the privilege of spending a day with Ernan in Cambridge, England, in the Sedwick Museum of Earth Sciences amidst the fossils. I asked Ernan about the relationship between science and theology. Ernan, I was trained as a scientist. I have a deep desire to know whether God exists, but many scientists say that there is absolutely no relationship between science and what we may hope to think about the possibility of God. What do you think about the relationship of science to theology? I think theology has a great deal to, to, to learn from science. If you go back in the history of Judeo-Christian thought, and, and the same would hold for Muslim thought, one of the traditional views about the creation was that it was a sequential creation, that God did thus and so and thus and so and thus and so. Now, the implication of that is that, it, that from at the beginning it needed more adjustment, basically, that more had to be done. Now, Augustine in the fifth century was thinking deeply about that. And his answer was very radical because what he had to say was that from the beginning, the possibilities of all the kinds of things that will come later, those possibilities are there from the beginning. There's not a sequence. And he goes on to say, and those kinds will appear when the conditions of water and earth are right. Now, how about that? He realized that as far as the science of that time was concerned, that there was no way of substantiating that. He said the kind of knowledge of how those possibilities could, as it were, germinate is something that we don't understand. It will require a different level of knowledge. Well, yeah, and we've got it. We now can see how the possibilities of all that would come later were contained from the evolutionary standpoint within that first creation. The possibilities were there. Right from the beginning, they had the possibilities if, in fact, the conditions were right. Of course, that was essential for certain kinds of things to develop, for planets to develop, for complex elements to develop. All of that was contained within the original. Now, from that point of view, that insight, you see, has filled out a hole in traditional theology because it makes it possible to see something that Augustine hinted at and groped for, namely that a creator of our universe would in fact place within it from the beginning, as he put it, the seeds of all that would come later. 
we can spell that out in some detail today. Now, here is a place where, in fact, science has contributed to filling a hole in traditional theology. If you just look at what science has done in filling in the holes, some would say it's filled in all the holes, so you don't need the religion well, in the of first course, place. Well, of course, that's not the case, because it has not and cannot fill in why f physics should have a a subject to begin with. What is the precondition for there being a physics and therefore for there being a physicist that there should be a universe in the first place? But from that point of view then, it asks for an answer to the question why there should be a universe in the first place. But once you have that, once you allow that question to be asked and you allow the creator, a being of some kind, responsible for there being a universe, then in fact the rest of it follows because you ask yourself this, supposing you have a being of that sort faced with the act of creation, that act of creation is likely to bring about what the creator wishes to bring about. Now from that point of view the whole thing follows because the universe will be a long-lived one within which life will develop and all the rest of it. And from that point of view then, what physics has done today is to fill out the notion of what a transcendent creator would do in the first place. And that's something that traditional theology couldn't on its own do. The theologians of a thousand years ago had to suppose a God who is limited by having to, as it were, do it in sequence. The, the, the theologians of today, thanks to, to the ministrations of the physicists, can in fact fill out a universe such that it is worthy of a transcendent creator. Ernan argues that a deep understanding of science enriches theology in that God has embedded within creation the possibilities of all that would come later. Ernan's argument is based on his critical realism in both science and theology. But what is critical realism? And how does Ernan's critical realism work? That's why, at the Notre Dame Conference, I start with Paul Allen, whose doctoral dissertation was Ernan McMullen and Critical Realism in the Science-Theology Dialogue. When I was doing my, my thesis, and I, I came upon the writings of Ernan McMullen, I literally discovered like a treasure trove of discussions among philosophers of science who were dealing with the subject of realism. So McMullen himself has this concept of scientific realism, and the debates were very deep. And it struck me that there was a contrast with contemporary theology where debates about realism were somewhat muted, at least not as complicated or as complex as they were in science. Right, define briefly the, yeah. um, the dialogue in science, and then the, the analog in theology. So the realists basically want to affirm that there are entities, either ob observable or unobservable, uh, that, that do exist, and that when we uh, use language such as the word atom to describe an entity or an object that we know to be an atom, that it really does exist. That the word atom is not just some kind of useful fiction. Mm -hmm. Whereas anti-realists will say we need to be a little bit more hesitant and say that atom is a word that we use in English to describe something that is going on in reality, but it's approximating reality. That, that atom is generating a sense data that we sense through our equipment and our physical senses that enable us to describe something in that black box. Right. But the only reality is what we sense and we can never be as sure of the reality that's generating the sense data as we are right. the sense data. Right, but the realists want to say, actually, we understand something that's R going on here, right. and we're even willing to make a judgment that atoms exist. Exactly. So in theology, uh, realism is about God, ultimately. Sure. God is unobservable. Well, in science, there's a lot of unobservables. So there seemed to me at the time to be something to, to learn from the sciences about how do we affirm the existence of unobservable entities uh -huh. because God is definitely an unobservable entity. Right. So Erna McMullen was the, was the guy. He was the one who helped me sort of guide me through this literature a little bit with his own um, careful and historically nuanced understanding of what a realist could hold in the philosophy of science. But he was also a Catholic priest and a theologian in his own right. He understood enough of theology to be able to judge how to, how to bring insights from philosophy of science over to theology and when to leave it at the door. So in terms of, of, of Ernan's philosophy of science, as a critical realist, he would say, you can really know what's there. 
Yeah, he termed it a scientific realism. More than that, he used a more technical term uh, known as retroduction. Okay, so describe retroduction. Yeah, so retroduction is basically the way of saying that you can establish a causal explanation for an entity, uh, observed or unobserved, from the effects that it has in the world. So there's an inference from effect to cause. It's not a proof. It's not a proof, and what McMullen wants to say is whatever judgments we make today, we have to be willing to revise them in the future. Okay. So that doesn't necessarily mean we're mistaken. It just may be that we're inadequately judging the entity that we're trying to explain. So McMullen was cautious about just taking uh, realism and then saying, okay, here's how it can apply to theology. What would it mean to not be cautious. So the less than cautious approach would be to say that in science they use models and in science they use metaphors. Oh, look at that. In theology they also use models and metaphors to describe uh -huh, God. Uh -huh. Therefore, you know, just as science is critically realist because it uses meta models and metaphors, so is theology critically realist. Erna McMullen comes along and says, well, hold on. In theology you're talking not about some part or aspect of the world that's unobservable. You're talking about the creator of the entire universe. So there has to be a bit of a more of a disanalogy mm -hmm. between the structure of the discipline in the, in, the, in the region of the sciences and the structure of the theological discipline, which is going to look different. Paul goes with Arnon in appreciating how critical realism in the sciences, where unobservables like atoms are proven to exist, can apply in theology. Because God, if there is a God, would be an unobservable. But Paul also praises Ernan's caution in not applying scientific thinking wholesale to theology, because God, as the creator of the universe, would be radically different than anything in the universe. Critical realism grounds Ernan's understanding of science and of theology and of their interrelationship. I should speak to a philosopher of science who rejects critical realism. I meet Bas van Frossen, Ernan's intellectual adversary and his good friend. Ernan's realism was a very nuanced, uh, sophisticated form of realism, a scientific realism. His writing about science, he gives a big role to metaphor, to imagination, mm to the resources that a model may have uh, that would confront its own failure. He began with this at the end of the 60s. That's exactly when philosophers of science were s switching from theories to models in oh. their focus. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And he was one of the first ones to do this. Hmm. He analyzed the Bohr model of the atom, but exactly showing how this already, although it was not right, it had the resources in the model itself that could be exploited by Heisenberg so as to yeah. create a totally new picture mm. to overcome the failings of that very mm. model. Mm. Uh, you use the term that uh, to explain Ernan's uh, uh, position on critical realism as retroduction? Retro retroduction. What he means by it is the form of inference, according to Ernan, drives science, that makes science, as he said. He begins with Aristotle. What he begins with is a with the problem that he sees in Aristotle. Aristotle, in his theory of science, had two sides. One is what science is meant to do if, is give you an absolutely certain demonstration of why things act, why they have to behave the way they do. And in giving his explanations, he has to and does uh, refer to unobservable things, things to which there are mm. no access. But when he outlines his epistemology, form of inference that Aristotle has is just inference and abstraction, a kind of generalization from the level of perception. And that would never get you to any conclusions about the unobservable. That's right, right. This he sees as the, the problem, yeah. the problem that had to be overcome. Yeah. Because for his realism, he has to get to the unobservable. Exactly. Now, draw out uh, from Ernan's point of view what the process of science would, would actually look like given his philosophical orientation. As philosophers and scientists over this 2,000 year history that Ernan goes through try to make clear what exactly is this inference, they don't somehow bridge the gap that Aristotle left us with. 
deduction is not sufficient, induction is not sufficient, inference to the best explanation, Vernon says, that's an easily criticized idea. So he's not going to just stay with that. Mm. What he eventually arrives at, rest reduction, is still a process of inference, but crucially, it involves the introduction of new concepts, revolutionary changes in the conceptual approach to the subject. And that is what allows him to bridge the gap. So the difference between ordinary induction mm. and retroduction, retroduction mm -hmm. is this introduction of new... Now, does that occur every time you're doing science, or does that occur only in paradigm shifts? Not just in paradigm shifts, but also not just every day. Every day, statistical analysis is yeah, something yeah, yeah. that is learned and is, uh, right. it follows a recipe. But, but if you're going to try to find those unobservable entities that are the, the real thing in itself, right. you, you have to be able to add that n the new concepts right. to the induction. That's right. Let me get to your point of view, because yeah. now that we've made a lot of sense out of this, mm -hmm. You critique it. Yes. You have a constructive empiricism, yes. which basically says, I think, and you'll correct me, mm. that you really can never get to that unobservable. I say that it is not actually part of the aim of science to do so. I see the first difference between the scientific realist and the empiricist, that they see different criteria of success in science. Okay. The realist says the criterion of success is truth, and to accept the theory, that will have to involve believing that it is true and that the things that it talks about are there, including the unobservable. The empiricist says, no, the aim of science is to construct empirically adequate theories. And the bottom line is empirical success. So that uh, the construction of models that may have in the model all kinds of things that correspond to nothing, but are models that the phenomena can fit so that they allow us to predict and manipulate. That is the success that is looked for. That's, in one sense, a lower bar. Yes. It's a lower bar, yes. but from your point of view, it's a bar that can be achieved. And the yes. other higher bar uh, right. is, it, from your point of view, it's imp impossible in principle or just impossible technologically? No, I think there's an, uh, an impossibility in principle here. So that's a very significant difference. Yes, In terms is. of our understanding of the whole world, much even more so science. For me, it is a different understanding of the enterprise of science. Mm -hmm. And the success consists in the fact that we can see the phenomena having a place in these models mm -hmm. in such a way that we get an overview of relations between the mm -hmm. phenomena mm -hmm. and then we can, as I say, predict and manipulate. Mm -hmm. So this is a way of seeing science rather than seeing the world. Boss famously is an anti-realist meaning that things as they really are are just not knowable. Boss draws a sharp line between what science actually does and what science actually knows. Science models and manipulates, but science cannot access external, independent, deep reality. Ernan McMullen, of course, disagreed. He was a realist. What we see is what is really out there. But why? Was Ernan's realism related to his religion? I speak with a philosopher of science known more for his intellect than for his sensitivities, who enjoys science-religion controversies, Michael Roos. Michael was a longtime colleague of Ernan's. Michael is an atheist. Certainly for Ernan, I think the whole question of realism was very important. One thing I wish I'd asked him more about was the extent to which realism and being a Catholic priest might have been linked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, if I look back at it, it seems to be obvious that if you believe in a good God, good creator God, who created us in his own image, uh, gave us the power of reason, then God's not going to be sneaky <laughs> and lie to us about the world. I mean, it may be difficult to find out about it. Mm. That's okay but that at some level I would have thought realism comes from the territory. But then we have somebody else like Bas van Frassen, who is a top-notch philosopher, a practicing Roman Catholic, and very iffy on the realism <laughs> question indeed. <laughs> right. uh, but from Ernan's point of view, how, how does realism in the world and realism in theology articulate? Well, obviously, realism in theology for Ernan was a given. 
I mean, for Ernan, this is a world created by a necessarily existing God and, and all of that. So uh, in the world of theology, it's, real, it's as real as it's ever going to get. In the world of science, though, there's long been debates, and of course these have been, let us say, exacerbated by quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. about the extent to which the scientist, I mean, yes, this is real, yeah. I'm real, <laughs> I think you're real, uh, but what about molecules? And as they get smaller and smaller and odder and odder, what about these? Are they really real? Maybe it's not real. Maybe it's all something made up that you like you talk about the square root of minus one. Mm -hmm. You know it's not real, but it works. It's pragmatic. It's a bit like a, a sausage machine. Right. You put your empirical facts in at one end, <laughs> you turn the machine, and out come predictions at the other. But as long as the sausages taste okay, <laughs> as long as the predictions work, don't ask, mm. don't say what goes on. So I think that's been a very influential philosophy of science in the 20th century. Is this a distinction without a difference? Uh, or is, is, oh, is no, it a it's fundamental, a, well, it's a fundamental question? Uh, because it's, a, it's an epistemological question and or it's an ontological question. I wouldn't use the word ontology, I'd be more inclined to say metaphysical. Uh, is <laughs> an, at, at some level, this is all metaphysics, if you like. Of course it is. I mean, is there a world that exists when we're not around to look at <laughs> yeah. it? I mean, these are the most fundamental metaphysical questions you can have. Sure. Or what the philosophers are trying to do, making sense of what the scientists mm. are doing. And of course, Ernan did quite a bit of work here. Mm. And that, at some level, is epistemological. Mm. Do scientists take inductive reasoning seriously? Is the notion of simplicity important? Now, I wouldn't have said immediately that these are metaphysical questions, but they're certainly epistemological logical questions. Why does one, a scientist, prefer the simpler solution? Obviously, Ernan's going to say, well, God made the world. He made the world in the best possible way. And there is an elegance to simplicity. So at some level, it is theological <coughs> come metaphysical. But at the same time, I think, as far as philosophers of science are concerned, and of course, I knew Ernan as a philosopher of science. You know, it's epistemology all the way down. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> It's epistemology all the way down. What can we know and how can we know it? That's the essence of critical realism. As I reflect on science and theology, biased perhaps by my scientific training, I see science continuing to advance, controlling progressively more explanatory space, and theology continuing to retreat defending progressively less. Then I remember, about a decade prior, that was precisely the question I had put to Ernan. Any scientist would say, to use a metaphor, of religion and science are in one room, science has been painting that room gradually and so that religion has been withdrawing more and more so that now religion is in a tiny corner and the only thing that science hasn't painted is why the universe is there in the first place. I love that metaphor because, in fact, you can fill out, paint out the corner if you want, but what you don't have the room. <laughs> That is, you need a room to be painted. I mean, that metaphor is very telling. I like that metaphor. We have a long way to go in, in, in science, but uh, it is making progress. It's making progress, yeah, and it will gradually paint out towards the corner and maybe even get to the corner. And then we ask why there's a corner or why there is a surface in the first place. And that seems to many people traditionally to be a legitimate question. The question is, do you rule out that question as illegitimate, which is what uh, unfortunately, physicists sometimes tend to do. But if that's a legitimate question and not something that you have to, as it were, push away, then in fact, I think religion has an answer. Does critical realism really matter? Science either can or cannot access ultimate reality. What's the big deal? Just get on with our experiments and studies. No. The reason that critical realism matters is that it sets boundaries on the ultimate scope of human knowledge, not only in science, but also potentially in theology. Ernan McMullen favored critical realism in science. What we access and perceive is what exists and is real. 
His critical realism recognizes subtle limitations on our capacity to know. And his seeking new ways of knowing, such as metaphor, suggests richer ways to apprehend reality. As for critical realism in theology, Ernan had no doubts. What we perceive as God really is God. Did Ernan's theological beliefs influence his realism? Probably, but so what? Ernan was wise in exercising caution when applying science to theology. When dealing with the creator of the universe, he said, facts about things in the universe may not much matter. To me, critical realism is a big deal. Can we human beings with our three pound brains access ultimate reality? Can we get much closer to truth? For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.